This was Elijah. Elijah was a mountain man, came out of the mountain regions of Gilead. And he just peer, appears suddenly upon. We know nothing about his background, nothing, nothing about it, other than uh, he was a settler, which is a mountain man uh, of, the, of the mountainous regions of Gilead, uh, which is the east side of the Jordan. And he shows up on the scene. He shows up at the state capital of Samaria of the North Kingdom. And he has a message from God for the king Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And what is interesting is the way he introduced himself. In chapter 17, verse 1, he introduced himself with what's called the prophetic, uh, a prophet's oath. And that we discussed that last week. And he told the king that uh, God had sent him with a message that uh, Israel would go through a drought. There would be no dew nor rain except by his word, by the word of the prophet who would speak for God when it was time to withhold it. And he is telling the king that Israel is about to go under the second curse of divine discipline. God is going to shut down the entire economy. And, uh, and it happened instantaneously. When he, left the, when he left the king's office, it went into a severe drought. Now, we know that it was going to last three and a half years from James' account in the fifth chapter. When he left the king's office, we enter into 1 Kings 17, 2 through 6. And God tells Elijah where he wants him to go and where he wants him to stay. So let's pick that story up and then we'll have a word of prayer. I want you to pay attention to verse 2 and verse 5 when I get there and pay attention to the words, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Because it divides our, our lesson section into two parts, 2 and 4, 2 through 4, 5 through 6, based on the word of the Lord. Here we go. Now he's just left the king's office. And here's what God tells Elijah. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Go away from him, from here, and turn eastward, that is, go across Samaria, the capital of the north kingdom, was on the west side. He's to cross the Jordan to the east side. I want you to hide yourself by the brook uh, Kerish, which is near the east of the Jordan. Okay, so we, we, we've got a kind of idea where it is. Turn eastward, hide yourself. It shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded, which is an interesting idea, the ravens, which is part of the crow family, to provide for you there. Now, look, he... Look, he knows he's going to be there until God gives him the word to, to with, r remove the drought, right? God says, you, you, stay, you stay with me, and when I tell you the drought's over, the drought's over. He didn't tell him three and a half years. We're not told three and a half years. You're not going to learn the word three years until you get chapter 18. He says, you go there, you stay there until I tell you to come out and go back to the king. Okay? Now, what's interesting to me is he commands the ravens. A raven is a large black bird that would look like a crow to uh, you and I. It's part of the crow family. But its, it's, it's average weight is three pounds. We're introduced to this bird in Genesis 8, 7. It was one of the two birds sent out of the ark. The first bird sent out was a raven, the second bird a dove. 
I became really interested in this bird many years ago and started writing a book on these two birds in the ark, their life before the ark, their life in the ark, and their life after the ark. Because these birds are so opposite. And uh, so I, I kind of liked the raven, <laughs> the way I wrote about him. I kind of liked him. He was just a tough old bird until he got on the ark and he met this dove, this peaceful, loving dove. And he's just a hard-nosed guy that would pick your, peck your eye out in a minute if you crossed him. And it just the, this, the time on the boat and the change in the two birds was kind of interesting in my story. Uh, but anyhow, the raven. And his method of defense, the raven's method of defense was pretty unique. He would peck the eyes out of the enemy. When uh, people learned that, when they crucified people or paled them, uh, one of the cruel things that would happen to that person before he died was more than likely the ravens would have pecked his eyes out. That was their delicacy. It was their defense and delicacy food, apparently. Well, anyhow, the raven's kind of an interesting bird. Of all the birds that you might have got, and so... We're in the 9th century B.C., and God has a drone system. He's got a food delivery business. He commands the ravens. Now, we're probably from Samaria capital to where we are on the other side of the Jordan. We're probably five miles. And he's going to command the ravens. This is interesting to me that God can command a bird. Now, of all the birds, the crow family is one of the smartest. The ravens are well known in history for how smart they are. Uh, there were people that could teach them complete sentences and several. They're a smart bird, quite a hunter. Well, anyhow, he's, he's commanded the ravens. Isn't it funny he can get a bird? An ornery, an ornery bird to obey him, and he can't get a sweet, loving person like you. <laughs> Something wrong with that picture, isn't there? Well, anyhow, he commanded the ravens to provide for you, and what he's going to do, and it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I've commanded the ravens. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. There it is. Look what he did. The word came to him. And he left with it. There's one thing to come to church to get the word. It's another thing to leave it with it. All right, that's, a mini, that's a mini study for you right there. Hopefully you'll leave this church today with the message with you. The word of the Lord went with him. And he went and lived by the brook Kirit, which is east of the Jordan. Now watch this. Watch verse 5. These ravens commanded by God to feed this prophet. For three years, they're going to make this trip. Now, I don't know how many ravens. We're not told how many ravens. Would you like to know the captain of the ravens that set this whole logistical nightmare up? But they're going to have to make two trips. They're going to have to make an morning trip and an afternoon trip. Watch where they're going to get their food to deliver. So he, he went and did according to word. Verse 6, And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat on the evening, and he would drink from the brook. Later you'll find out that he's taking it from the king's table. They're getting it from the king's palace. And they're, they're bringing, listen, they're in a drought. Listen, in the worst crisis in any nation, you know who stays fed and fat? Whoever runs it. You know, the government didn't shut down. The economy did. 
Isn't that interesting? So the only place you're going to get good meat and good bread fresh every day for three years of a drought is from the king's table. Those smart birds went in there and got that. Now, I don't know if Eli gave, gave him a menu. Maybe he was thankful like he should have been for God's grace. But this is a wonderful picture, listen to me now, of logistical grace. When you look at the six stages of grace that we talk about here, you have saving grace, logistical grace, growing grace, suffering grace, dying grace, and surpassing grace. Let me tell you, saving grace and logistical grace is for your feet on earth. Suffering grace is for your feet on earth. Growing grace is for your feet on earth. Then you go to dying grace. Listen, God is full of grace for you while you're still here. Logistical grace is God taking care of you. He takes care of Elijah. Elijah, I want you to go into hiding. He didn't say, I want you to go get a job. I want you to go into hiding. I'm going to take care of you. I take care of my people. I take care of my people. It's a wonderful story. This is a wonderful story of logistical grace, the doctrine of logistical grace. Philippians 4.19. This is Philippians 4.19. We'll read it in a minute. We'll read it in a minute. Let's have prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue type, or overt type, overt sins. How do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality, which the Christian is to live? I confess my sin. The work of Christ on the cross deals with sin, both Adamic sin and personal sin. Adamic sin is salvation. Believe the gospel. He died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead third day. If you believe that, you get saved. You get saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. But as a believer, when you commit a personal sin, the work of Christ and the cross is extended to your life in cleansing, not for salvation, but for spirituality. When you confess your sins, it restores you to spirituality, which is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, don't you know that your body's the temple of God? You're in the church age. Your body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. Your body is no longer your own. It belongs to the Lord. He purchased it at Calvary. So I give you a moment to confess your sins so that the Bible becomes a living book, not, not a dead book with dust on it. A living book with a living God. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he will bring the Bible to life in your soul. John 14, 26, he will teach and recall it. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of how the ravens took care of Elijah in hiding by the grace of God. We're call, that's called logistical grace. God will supply all of your needs according to his logistical grace. We're thankful for that promise, Father. It applies to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's our second lesson in this series of the life of Elijah. Last Sunday, we, we began this series, and I introduced, as I introduced in my message today, the message brought to Elijah was that the nation of Israel had become saturated with demonic idolatry of the failing cult called Baal worship, B-A-A-L. Elijah married a Canaanite unbeliever, Jezebel, who brought in all of her pagan gods of the failing cult and as a gift to her, Ahab, the king of Israel, allowed her religion of demonic idolatry to become the state religion, funded and cared for and protected by the government. Now, 
we saw last week that God describes Ahab as the most evil king. He was number eight from Jeroboam, the most evil king of all the kings. He was number eight. And God has said, God has had enough. This is the priest nation. You know, when David died, the kingdoms were divided in two states, the north kingdom and the south kingdom of the priest nation. And the north kingdom went evil under, under Jeroboam. And they stayed that way. They lasted till 722 when God took them out under the fifth cycle of Leviticus 26 to Assyria. You know what that tells you? See, we're in the ninth century. And by the time we get to the eighth, see, we went from 930. Now we're down, we're down into 850 so. And God's not going to take that kingdom out till 722. You know what that proves? 2 Peter 3, 9. Now listen, because it applies to your life. God is long suffering and patient towards us all that None would perish, but all would come to repentance. Come to change your mind about how you think you're going to make it through this life and the next without Christ. And listen, if you don't have Christ, you don't have God. No man can come to the Father God except through me, Jesus said in John 14, 6. It's a sobering idea, isn't it? I remember hearing that as clear as a bell as an unbeliever and went, hmm. That's a hard pill to swallow. Well, the message to the king was this. Get rid of demonic idolatry in this nation or I'm going to put you under the cycles of discipline. I'm going to put you under the second one. All right? If you want to read the second cycle, not now, but later, I put it on your paper. Leviticus 26, 18 through 20. Well, maybe now. When I see blank looks, I read it. Listen to this. I'm in, I'm in the second cycle. If you, if you read through Leviticus 26, you can pick up five cycles. I'm in the second cycle. If also after these things, you do not obey me, this, was what he, this is what Elijah has carried to King Ahab. Then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will also break down your pride of power, national power. I will, watch the I wills. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. They were an agricultural economy. And your strength shall be spent uselessly trying to scratch out enough food to live. Not to invest. Not to share. Next week I'll show, it. I'll show you an example of it. For your land shall not yield its produce and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Boom. And then he goes into another cycle. It's really interesting. This is what's going to happen to him. And it's going to happen. It's going to last three and a half years. And listen, it's going to be as bad the first year as it was the last year. How do I know it? Because what is, what, listen, God says that the day that you reject, and he did it. He, before that day was over and Elijah left the capital, before he left the city, God had already established it and told him, go hide. And he's going to be in hiding for three years before he comes out. How do I know the first day was as bad as the last day? Because God said, I'm going to make the sky like iron and the earth like bronze.
Now, this is the God that told the ravens to hand carry the meals for three years, morning and night, and not eat it. These are carnivorous birds. Think about that. God's an awesome God. Do you not know that? You don't think he is. You don't act like he is. You don't live like he is. But he's an awesome God. You need to have him on your team. If you were going to choose a team to choose up sides, first guy you'd want to pick would God. The second guy would be Jesus. Third guy would be the Holy Spirit. There's the first three picks. Listen, for the average, the average person and many in the church, that's the last three they pick. They pick Satan, number one, like Ahab. Don't do that. Don't do that. And listen, that thing is going to hit the first day. It's going to last till the last day. The first day and the last day are not going to be any different. It was miserable. And there will be no dew in the evening and no rain in the day. Wow. And he says, and it won't change until I say so. When Ahab went home and told Jezebel, she says, well, then we'll cut his tongue out. You know, that'll solve your problem, won't it? Like I can't speak to God in my heart. Okay, let's look at five things about the Ravens food service. It's going to last three years. And, and these Ravens are going to carry this food morning and night, about a five-mile five mile trip. Five-mile trip. Back and forth. Five miles out, five miles back. Number one, King Ahab rejected Elijah's message containing the directive will of God. We know it because Elijah immediately went in hiding for three years. King Ahab rejected Elijah's message containing the directive will of God. Shut down the idolatry system. I'm, I'm going to put you under the second cycle of discipline. I'm going to shut down your economy absolutely from day one to day to I, I, from the first day to the last day. I'm shutting it down. Now, you know, in the past, I've studied this in the past, and I often thought as a pastor that could never happen in America. It's, the, the economy is too complicated. We have agriculture. We have industry. We have resorts. We have water. We have, we have businesses in the water. But he did it, didn't he? Shut us down in a day. That's pretty amazing to me. You can shut down this enormous economy in a day. And we've been shut down for, what, three months? Something like that. Who's counting, right? So what's going on? I told you last week what I think is going on. This is not discipline. This is more like Joseph, where he gave you prosperity to keep you through. Listen, we've had three of the best years of prosperity. Why? To carry us through this, right? Have you not paid attention for the last three years on our economy? Listen, this is, this is, this is Joseph, where he gave seven years of plenty for seven years of bad. So what's God trying to teach us? He's trying to bring a spiritual awakening like he did here. I'm going to bring a spiritual awakening, and you better have it. Listen, a spiritual awakening is to say to the unbeliever, you need God, and to say to the believer, you need to get back and tell people about God. This is to bring a spiritual awakening. And listen, it's worldwide. This is not just local what says, okay, boy, I need to get busy and, and do Birmingham and reach the state of Alabama or reach, reach America. Listen, the last time I heard a count, it was 186 countries. This is a worldwide awakening. I believe this is the greatest day for the church ever. If we'll do anything about it other than set in fear. 
I mean, the whole thing runs by faith. You know, I love this little logo they have. Facts, not fear. Listen, facts produced fear. These three months, all we've had is facts that produce fear. No, it's faith. you got to have, not facts. Listen, facts, who knows? One day it's one fact, the next day it's another. Facts produce fear. Faith is what takes care of fear. Faith takes care of fear, not facts. Good grief. I don't know. You teach the people the truth of the word of God, and they still question it, like Ahab. In the divine chain of command, it is the Lord God of Israel, then the monarchy, and then the citizens. It's God, God, the government, and the people. You take God out of this, which they did, the whole reason the whole North Kingdom is in existence before, because of God, every nation is in existence. Any nation that's in existence today is because God put it there. I don't care what the nation is. Whether they acknowledge God or not, He put them in existence. Genesis 10 and 11. Genesis 10 and 11. I gave you some Bible verse well worth your read. Romans, the 13th chapter, 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 7. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. These are all passages that tell you where the authority of the government comes from. It comes from God Almighty. Now, I know you all know this. I'm speaking to the Internet. There are a lot out there that don't know that. Some of these people that are with us now are from some of these nations that don't have any of this information. And they, they sure need it. Now, here's a doctrinal point. Under point one, here's a doctrinal point. Romans 13, 1 and 2. There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever res resists the authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. You know, it's one thing to bite the hand that feeds you when it's your own. <laughs> when it's your own? Is that not insane? Good grief. Here's point number two. Are you with me? Huh? Yeah. Point number two. Because the king, Ahab, rejected the directive will of God, shut down the north, shut it, shut down the demonic idolatry of the Phalic cult, or I'm going to shut down your whole nation. When he rejected that directive will, the north kingdom was placed under the second cycle of divine discipline, Leviticus 26, 18 through 20. He shut down the entire economy of a nation. Leviticus 26, 19, I will break down the pride of your power. I will make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. That's because it was an agricultural economy. If then you act with hostility against me, which Ahab did, and are unwilling to obey me, which Ahab didn't, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sin. That's not going to be good. Well, what about, what about the believers? We're taking care of those. Who's taking care of the believers? Who's taking care of all those people that believe in God? Same person who's taking care of the ravens. Matthew 6 chapter. When you doubt that, go out and watch the birds and watch the flowers. Matthew 6, chapter. You know how encouraging it was every day on logistical grace for that prophet to have a raven show up with his food? Don't you know that was a powerful prayer that day? of thanksgiving 
for the food he had, fresh meat and bread, and he had the clearest crystal water while everything else was dried up. A drought for three. We've seen a drought for a couple months and our lakes all dry up. For three years, he's been given the king's food. He's been eating the king's food and drinking the crystal spring water that God has provided flows every day. Everything else is dried up. Everything is under economic collapse. This guy's eating like a what? Eating like a what? A king. (laughs) You must know by now that God has a sense of humor. And he's eating like a king. You know why? Logistical grace. Does he deserve it? No, he doesn't deserve it. You don't get it because you deserve it. You get it because you're identified with God. This man is identified with God. Ahab is not identified with him. And listen, he's got food because he can afford it. He can get it. He can have it brought in by ship. And God lets him get it. He has the best cooks in the world, prepares the best food, and then feeds his prophet like a king. That's logistical grace at its best. Point number three. Then God turned his attention to the messenger as he left the king. The Lord made two important doctrinal points of logistical grace that you must learn today. In chapter 17, 2 through 4, and five and six. It all begins, the key to logistical grace, listen to me, is the word of God. The word of God. If you have a relationship with God, the next thing he wants you to have a relationship is with his word. His word. The word came to him and the word went with him. Wasn't that interesting? That's the Christian life. You put your feet in some place where they can teach you the word of God that can spiritually develop you so that you know how to live under all conditions of life. You can live like a king. Because you have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords. The word of the Lord came to Elijah with a promise. And the word of the Lord went with Elijah with the promise of provisions. Here's the promise to the king. If you don't get rid of demonic idolatry of the failing cult, I'm I'm going to make your life miserable. Not because you should be made miserable, because I want you to come back to me. I want to have a wonderful relationship with you on the principles of grace and forgiveness. He's not punishing people. He's trying to get people to come to their senses. This is not about punishment today. It's It's an awakening. I've been talking about a third spiritual awakening. We have it. This is a great time for the church. The church has always had these times with great crisis and then calmness and a spiritual awakening. This is a time for the church to arise. I'm telling you, this is it. It couldn't be clearer. It could not be clearer. This is worldwide. This is worldwide. If there was ever a day of preparation for the coming of Christ, it is now. This is a world awakening to God. Well, let me show you some guys. Now, it's not on your paper, so I want you to get your pencil. 
there's one in your pew. I want you to write some names down. Because you want some really interesting stories of guys who go through this. Why has God put him in hiding and taking care of him? Well, it's for training, isn't it? God always does that. He always does that. Listen to these names. Listen to these names. Joseph. Sent him to a foreign nation, Egypt. Wound up in prison. All with the intent in Genesis 50, 20, to preserve a people of God, to preserve the people of God. He took them out of prison and put them in the palace. All of that going to Egypt was a preparation to put him in a position in Egypt, prime minister, during the seven years of famine and the seven years of plenty, the seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, to preserve a people a future, training for a future event that was gigantic. A spiritual awakening event. If you have eyes to see it. That when now we have Elijah. The same type of thing with Elijah. It's to bring a spiritual awakening. Then we got Moses. God sends him to the desert for training, for the exodus, for the people of God, a spiritual awakening. You have David. God sent him out and lived in caves to bring a spiritual awakening, to put him on the throne for a godly kingdom. A godly kingdom, you could say, the throne of David will one day be the throne of Christ in the millennium. A spiritual awakening. Then you have, you have Saul, Paul. Saul of Tarsus, known to us as Paul. He takes him and puts him in the Arabian desert to train him for, to be one of the great missionaries to show the church you must be worldwide. It was a spiritual awakening. That's just a few. That's just a few people that we could find similarities for ourselves. I'm telling you, when the sun rises on this crisis, it would be interesting if the church goes back to the same old, same old, or whether they get on the move for God. This is a great opportunity for the church to become part of a great spiritual awakening in the world. Here is a point of logistical grace you need to know. When the logistical grace is connected to the directive will of God, there are three things in the directive will of God that must always line up. They must always line up. You can't have one, you can't have two, you've got to have three. They must always line up in the directive will of God. The geographical will, the operational will, and the mental will. They must always, listen, when, you, when God reveals something to you, there's three things always involved in it. With Elijah, with any of the guys I just mentioned, you're going to find that true. For Elijah, the geographical will, I want you to go back to the east side where he originally came from, Gilead. And I want you to go by Brook, he was familiar with. And I want you to hide there. This is a good hide. Sometimes, sometimes God says, I don't want you to hide. When he sent him from Gilead and sent him to, the, to Samaria, to the, to the capital city with a message, he didn't want him to hide. Now he wants him to hide because there's a training going on.
to bring a spiritual awakening. I want you to be in training. When this spiritual awakening is over, you're going to have to hit, you're going to have to hit the pavement full speed. Your, your feet are going to have to hit the ground going full speed. And that is the story of Elijah. It's a wonderful story. And I hope to be able to follow it with this theme of a spiritual awakening. The geographical will. It is a place, listen, the, crook, the, the brook is a place where God hides you for future service. We all have it. If you think back in your life, you will find that there was that place where he put you. He shut you down a while. He kind of like hid you and trained you in the word of God to turn you loose. We all have it. We all have it. Some of you are in the front part of it. You're about to have it. I guarantee you, I, if I talked to Horton five minutes, I could find it. Al Rosenblum. Myself. You. If you haven't, you will. There's always the geographical will. The geographical will. When God puts you into hiding, when he puts you off in it and, and secludes you, it's for training you for further service. The operational will of God. He says to him, I want you to hide during the drought. Why? Because he's going to train him for future service. So he went, watch this, he went and did according to the word of God. He didn't sit around and debate it. He didn't sit around and discuss it. He didn't sit around and go, why this, why that? He saluted and did it. You know, that's that faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You cycle it into my faith. I believe what I just heard. I believe it. And now I must walk it out. Walk by faith, not by sight. So that God can do what he promised. It's when God does what he promised. When it's the promise is one thing. The performance of what he promised is another. And listen, God gets a, big, gets a big kick out of being able to promise you something and then deliver it. I mean, can you remember, can you remember that, that, that special little gift you wanted for Christmas? And got it? You know where the real joy was? When you got that gift, the excitement of you getting something you really wanted, the person who gave it to you, it was worth everything for them because of the excitement, their joy of your excitement. That's the way God is. Our Heavenly Father is a wonderful parent. You think he... If you who are evil know how to do good things to your children, how much more God is a principle. And then the mental will of God. How is he going to deal with being isolated for three years? I've commanded the ravens to provide. Listen, he tells them, I've, I have <laughs> commanded ravens. To provide for you. That's logistical grace. To provide for you there. And he's going to do it evening and morning. Every day for three years. I know that from the 18th chapter verse 1. Point number four. The directive will of God involves logistical grace for Elijah. This is what we call. If you want a great example of logistical grace. This, the life of Elijah is it. I couldn't give you a better example. I could give you others, but what an example this is. God using the raven food service to take care of him and feed him like a king. This carnivorous bird. <laughs> Logistical grace is given to spiritual advancing believers by God to support the function of the will of God in their life regarding the plan of God. I know that's kind of wordy, but you need to get it. Question. Well, let me give you Philippians 
This is the New Testament logistical grace passage. My God will supply all your needs. That's a message to another person. That's a believer sharing with a believer, logistical grace. This is one believer sharing with another believer the importance of logistical grace. My God will supply all your needs according to God's riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's one believer sharing with another believer, like I am today with you, the importance of the doctrine of logistical grace. Logistical grace. Grace. Not just logistical. The answer, here's the question. What is God trying to teach the spiritual advancing believer by logistical grace? What's he trying to teach? Here it is. Point number five. God is trying to teach two important doctrinal principles about logistical grace to Elijah. And I'm trying to teach them to you. Number one, the secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. The secret. The secret. Don't forget that word. The secret of contentment. The secret. I'm about to release the secret to you. I'm going to give you the secret. Now, and here it is, Philippians 4, 11 and 12. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. That's inner content. In whatever circumstance I am, he's learned a doctrinal principle. He's learned a doctrinal principle to be content with God, not with his circumstances. I'm content with God in whatever circumstance I am. I know because I've learned the secret of contentment. I know how to get along with humble means. I've been with little. I've been with little. And I know how to live in prosperity. I've had much. In any and every circumstances, I've learned the secret of being filled, going hungry, and abundance, suffering need. What has he learned? Logistical grace. When he didn't have any, God took care of him. Lived, to be, lived for another day. When he had plenty, he lived for another day. Who took care of him? God. And what's God doing? He's training. He's training you how to be content with little or a lot. That's not the issue. The issue is God Almighty. The issue is God will supply all your needs according to his riches of glory in Christ Jesus. Here's another one. Here's the second doctrinal point here. God's grace, listen to me now, is always enough. Now I hope, for Elijah's sake, that the king liked a variety of foods. Because the same old, same old for three years would have got pretty tough. But I can tell you one thing for sure. God's grace is always enough. Whether you're in humble, grace is enough. Whether you're in prosperity, grace is sufficient. It's always enough. It's always sufficient. The word sufficient is enough. It's always enough. The humble, when you're in humble means, it's enough. When you're in prosperity, it's enough. Now, you don't have to tell that guy, do you? You have to teach the humble that. When I have very little, God's the same. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So here is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, and we'll close it out. And he said to me, said to Paul, my grace is sufficient, is enough for you. My grace is enough for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Watch the two therefores. 
most gladly. That's an inner, that's inner stuff. Most gladly is inner. It's an inner attitude. Most gladly is an inner attitude. That's an attitude of contentment because we've learned the secret. Most gladly, that's inner attitude. Most gladly. Therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me, not on me, in me. Therefore, I am well content. Got that? I am well content. Whether, watch these five whiz. With, wick, with weakness, I'm content. With insults, I'm content. With distresses, I'm content. With persecutions, I'm content. With difficulties, I'm content. Why? Because it's for Christ's sake that I suffer. That's undeserved. For when I am weak, here's how the power of Christ rests on me. When I am weak, then I am strong. Need to learn logistical grace. We're in a time for it. Logistical grace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way and stayed with us for an hour of Bible study. In the life of Elijah, we will learn so many great lessons for this time of crisis of COVID-19. These are great lessons, Father, whether, in, whether we're in the humble means of time or in the prosperity times. The lesson stays sim the same, for God is almighty and logistical grace always works. And it's always a training time, pushing us into a greater sense of relationship with God as his child, as his beloved. I pray today, Father, you would encourage our hearts to be part of the spiritual awakening. Stop complaining. Be content. Get into the most gladly of the inner, the inner person relationship with God. Understand what's going on is a good thing. All things work together for good. This is a good thing. For what reason? Is there a spiritual awakening going to happen towards God? And there has to be people out there with answers. Answers. Not anarchy. Answers. The truth, not lies, the truth. I made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.